Okay, so that's dualism out of the way. Uh, let's move on and we're just going to go quite quickly today because we have to cover all of behaviorism. So I'm going to look at psychological behaviorism first. So this was a movement in psychology in the 20th century that was reacting to a previous movement called uh, introspectionism. So introspectionism, championed by people like uh, William James here, said that, well look, psychology is supposed to be the study of the mind, study of things like feelings, desires, cognitions, etc. How do we have access to those things? Well, it seems like the best way to get access to them is just by introspection, which, as I've put here, is just observation of one's own mental states, looking inwards. So I ask you, do you feel a desire for coffee right now? You look inward and examine your uh, mental states. You say, no, I don't have any desire. I notice for, for coffee right now. Uh, somebody uh, sticks a needle in your arm to give you an injection, flu shot or something, says, do you feel pain? And you examine yourself, yes, I feel pain, right? So you just introspect on your mental states and then report on them. So that was the previous method that introspectionists were using. Now, behaviorism came along as a reaction to this method in psychology. Um, and Watson was a, uh, John Watson was an early advocate of this uh, method. And he, as he puts it here, psychology as the behaviorist views it is a purely objective experimental branch of natural science, which needs and should need, he, sh he should say here, uh, introspection as little as do the sciences of chemistry uh, or physics. You don't use introspection when you're doing physics, okay? And so the psychologists want it to be more like the other hard sciences uh, and just rely on objective things instead of subjective things, just looking inward and examining your own uh, mental states. So what the methodological or psychological behaviorists were doing was providing an answer to the question of how to study the mind. So here's a simple argument for this kind of behaviorism. Scientific data or knowledge uh, must refer, should only refer to publicly observable states and events, stuff we can all objectively access. Uh, physical events are public in this way, mental events are not, they're private. Therefore, uh, reports of physical events uh, like behavior can be scientific data or knowledge, but reports of um, introspective reports of mental events can't be. So this is a very simple argument, powerful argument, uh, for moving away from introspectionism towards something else. And the thing that behaviorists wanted to move away to was behavior. Now this was, I mean, the background here is from an early 20th century movement, intellectual movement, also in philosophy, logical positivism, which emphasized things like simple mistakes we make with language, as we'll see later today, um, verificationism as a form of uh, justification for things, uh, and empiricism. Uh, so just relying on empirical data that we can collect uh, rather than stuff like introspection. So that's just to give you a sense of, of where this movement came from. It was part of a much larger intellectual movement in the early 20th uh, century. Now notice that this argument doesn't show that Cartesian immaterial souls or minds don't exist. It just says that if they do exist, they can't be studied scientifically because scientific stuff, uh, uh, data or knowledge can only refer to publicly observable uh, things like behavior maybe. Okay, so uh, this was really not a theory about the mind, but uh, a theory about the science of psychology, about how psychology as a new emerging science should proceed. Uh, and it was very successful uh, because it dominated psychology for, for most of the 20th century. Um, it wasn't as successful, in, it, it died eventually because it wasn't as successful in being able to do what it claimed it could do. Now I've just put some candidates here for the, just to give a flavor as to what they were thinking of as behavior. So obvious candidates are actions involving bodily movements or straightforward, simple bodily movements, uh, but also physiological reactions uh, and responses. But basically anything that you can uh, look at and everybody can see, yeah, that stuff is happening. The, the, the subject, the person is behaving in these obviously um, publicly observable ways. Okay, 
Now, uh, you can do a historical unit in psychology, presumably looking at uh, how all this worked out, with classical conditioning and so on. An excellent resource for you if you are interested in this stuff is a wonderful book by the psychologist Andre Kukla and the philosopher friend and colleague of mine, Joel uh, Walmsley. Uh, this chapter five in particular is excellent. Psychology loses its mind. Uh, it gives a really good overview of the um, psychological behaviorist movement in the 20th century specifies their law of effect and drive theory and so on. So there are other resources that you can go to to, uh, to look at that, but we're not going to focus on that. What we're going to do is look instead at philosophical uh, behaviorism. So this was related to psychological behaviorism, but it was also a distinct movement. There are two forms of it. One, uh, which is sometimes called ontological, sometimes it's called uh, radical behaviorism. It said that mental states, it was making a strong claim. Mental states, like desires, beliefs, pains, and so on, uh, are nothing but behavior. Or, as we'll explain in a moment, dispositions to behave. So these people were radical because they're saying that attributions of mental states are always false. Strictly speaking, mental states don't exist. So that's why it's radical. You think, well, I feel a desire now for coffee. And they say, that seeming mental state actually doesn't exist. So statements like, Oshin is thirsty, where thirsty is a mental state, an experience of mine, a desire for water or something like that. Uh, they are like statements like, Santa Claus lives at the North Pole. Because the things, namely Santa Claus, and the mental state of being thirsty, strictly speaking, for these guys, don't exist. Now, in the Middle Ages, we thought that we could have a science of things like witches. But the behaviorists pointed out that uh, we were just wrong about that. And they think, similarly, we're wrong if we think we can have a science of mental states in the way that um, even the introspectionists were thinking about it. Internal states. Um, they, they were saying that these states don't exist, that really all that exists is behavior, uh, and that's what we have to uh, examine. So it was a radical claim. A related view, similar, um, logical or analytical behaviorism, they, it was a, basically a semantic um, theory that said that every meaningful uh, psychological expression uh, can be and should be defined uh, only in terms of behavioral uh, and physical expressions. Um, so notice that this is just a claim about the meaning of sentences that contain seeming attributions of mental states. Uh, so they're not claiming that mental states don't exist. So it's not radical in that way. Uh, they're just saying that statements or claims that uh, mention <coughs> mental states are meaningless. So that's what we're going to focus on. Uh, that's the, the, the main uh, topic of today's lecture. So let's move on and see what that logical or analytical behaviorist movement uh, was saying. So to begin with, just imagine the following situation. Imagine a friend of yours from somewhere else comes to visit. They want to know where you go to university. They come to visit you uh, here at Monash. So you give them a little tour. Uh, you show them the Menzies building, you show them the library, uh, you show them some places to eat. You, you might even just exhaustively take them around every building in the university and say, well, this is the science building, blah, blah, blah. You, you show them everywhere, okay? So that all goes really well. But then at the end, they say to you, well, this is great. I enjoyed my tour. Um, but I asked you at the beginning, I wanted to see the university. But you just showed me the Menzies building and you showed me the library, and uh, at no time did you actually show me the university. What's your reaction to this? Let's say you take me on this tour, and I say that to you at the end. You show me the library, Menzies building, and then at the end I say, wonderful, but where's the university? I want to see it. That's what I wanted to see. I want you to take me to the university in the same way that you took me to the Menzies building. So what, what goes wrong in a situation like this? The university is the, the main the category to which all of these things belong. Which is to say, you have seen the university because the university is constructed of these parts in the same way of what is made up of cells. 
Sure, okay, so you could say that the university is something, a larger entity that is composed of these things, uh, and that's right. But there's also something else. So let's say that the president of the university and the administration, they all went a bit nuts on a Monday morning, and they just decided, to hell with it, we're just going to uh, uh, write down a, a, a legal document saying that the university is going to move five miles east and occupy that space. If they do that, then suddenly, at the signature of the president or something like that, uh, all of these buildings no longer are the university. And whatever is five miles uh, east of here is suddenly Monash University. So the university isn't tied to these physical things. Uh, it's something that, as it were, supervenes on these physical things. So it's, it's a different category of thing than these individual physical things. I can say, look here, if you go over to the Menzies building, you can kind of bang it on the wall and go, this is the Menzies building. And we can't just designate something else as the Menzies building. <clears throat> Menzies building is the name of this physical thing. But the university, Monash University, is not like that. It's a different category of thing. So this person, when they say to you, I want to see the university, they're making, as it were, what Gilbert Ryle calls a category mistake. They're thinking of the university as belonging to the category of things like buildings, but it's not that kind of thing, okay? So consider these sentences. I'm going to the library, I'm going to the university. <clears throat> so in explaining how this is a category mistake, uh, Ryle says, because these words, these terms, occupy or uh, play the same sort of role, they occupy the same place and, and uh, function similarly uh, in each sentence, it's tempting uh, to, to conclude that in virtue of that, they must belong uh, to the same uh, category of, of things. But they don't, as we just saw, because somebody might make a mistake, uh, a category mistake in, in asking, no, no, I want to see uh, the university. Now the point here uh, is that language can trick us into these kinds of mistaken conclusions. And the analytical or logical behaviorists about the mind wanted to say that uh, our talk about mental states is similar. So we might say, I move my arm because my muscles contracted. And then you might say, I moved my arm because my mind chose to. And because uh, my muscles and my mind, um, uh, it seems like the place that they occupy in the sentences is similar. We might think of them as the same, belonging to the same category of things. But Ryle's point and the point of the logical behaviorists is that they are actually uh, members of different categories of things, even though it seems like from these sentences uh, that they belong to the same category of things. So basically, the muscles here end up being like things like buildings, the Menzies building, um, but the mind ends up being something like a university. Uh, it's, it's a different category of thing, and we make a mistake if we think that um, it's the same uh, kind of thing. Okay, and so that's how we end up getting the question, uh, what sort of thing is the mind? That's the question we started with. But Ryle's suggestion here is that even in asking that question, you've made a mistake. Because the mind isn't a thing like other things, bottles and taxis and doorknobs, etc. Uh, it's not a thing like those things. And so uh, the question, what sort of thing is a mind, is just a weird feature of how our language works that tricks us. So just to make sure everybody's clear about this, um, here's a question. So what is the origin of the category mistake according to the logical behaviorist? Do they say that Cartesian dualism, A, makes a mistake about what kind of thing or entity, let's say immaterial versus material, uh, the mind is? Or, instead, do they say, B, uh, that Cartesian dualism makes a mistake about whether the mind is an immaterial or material thing or entity at all? Think for a moment. So, I mean, are they, are they, is the dualist making a mistake about whether the mind is a physical thing or a mental thing, 
or are they making a mistake about thinking about the mind as a thing at all? B. Which? B. B. Okay, why? Sure, okay. So that is the, 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 uh, the thing that they're saying is B here. They're not saying that the dualist is making a mistake about thinking about the mind as an immaterial thing. They should be thinking about it as a material thing. They're saying, I mean, next week we'll see the mind-brain uh, identity theorist is saying that we should think of the mind as a physical thing. But the behaviorists are saying you shouldn't think about it as either kind of thing at all. It's not a kind of thing, okay? The mind is just not a thing. It's something else. That mental talk is a, is a kind of a weird way of talking about something else other than a thing. Okay? So let's get clear about how that's working. So it's a semantic theory. I mentioned this already. Uh, it's one about the meaning of mental uh, attributes or uh, claims like thirsty uh, or believes and so on. So Oshim is thirsty. When we say that, um, the behaviorist is saying that really we're saying something like Ushin is drinking a lot of liquid. Here I am guzzling down the water and so you know oh, Ushin is thirsty, obviously, right? Now take a, 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 what they think is an analogous pair of sentences. Uh, the average person has 2.4 children. They're saying that really when we say that kind of thing, what we're saying is if you add up the total number of children and divide the number of, uh, by the number of persons, the result is 2.4. So they're saying that the average person is not a thing. You can't say, oh, I hate people who have 2.4 children. I want to find the average person and arrest them. Arrest the average person, okay? Good luck to the police officer who is asked to go out and find the average person and put them in handcuffs. They're making a category mistake. The average person is not a thing that you can go and find. And so the behaviorists are saying that in the same way that there's no such thing as the average person, that's just a kind of a shorthand way of talking about what sentence 2b is saying. And they think that something similar is going on with mentalistic language. And just in the way that we can, if we have to be really particular about it, so the police officers are getting ready, right, I'm going out to uh, arrest the average person. You say, no, 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 you've misunderstood me. Don't go out trying to find the average person. All I was trying to tell you is what sentence 2b says. Blah, 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 if you add up the total number, and they go, oh, okay, and now I understand. I don't have to go and find anybody called the average person. Um, so we translate that sentence for them so they understand it better. The logical behaviorist is saying that we should do a similar thing with sentences like, Oshin is thirsty. It should really be translated as something like, Oshin is drinking a lot of liquid. So that's what they think uh, we should be doing. It's just a convenient way of talking to say that uh, Oshin is thirsty but it's not, strictly speaking, uh, accurate. Okay, so they want to do this task of translating out all mentalistic terms into purely behavioral terms. Any problems arising for you right away with the claim that Oshin is drinking a lot of liquid is a correct translation of Oshin is thirsty? You can be thirsty and not have any... Yeah, I'm out in the outback, in the desert. I forgot to bring water, right? I've been there for two days, somehow still surviving, on my last legs. Do the behaviors have to deny that I'm thirsty just because I'm not exhibiting the behavior of drinking a lot of water? It seems like they are, and that seems like an absurd uh, result. So they've got to get out of that problem at least. So let's see how they do it. <coughs> so here's uh, a difficulty. Ordinary language allows that somebody can be in a mental state without behaving at all, as we've just said in the desert case. So I can say, wow, I'm thirsty, but I've got no water. Um, so there's no point in showing maybe that I'm thirsty. So I'm not exhibiting any behavior at all maybe uh, relevant to, uh, to the behaviorist. So their solution for this problem is to equate um, mental states with behavioral dispositions. So we say salt is soluble even though there's no water around and it's not actually dissolving in water right now. Um, but what we mean there is if we were to put salt in water, then it would dissolve. So it's a disposition that will manifest under certain circumstances, namely here, being put in water. 
So they think that we need to do something similar here. Instead of saying that Oshin is thirsty should be translated as Oshin is drinking a lot of water, they'll say it should be translated as if Oshin had access to something to drink, then he would drink it. And so that takes care of the desert case. I don't have any water, I'm not drinking, but they're saying that I still have this behavioral disposition that if you were to suddenly bring in a jug of water, wow, I'd start guzzling it right away. Yeah. They're hoping that it is. They're hoping that it is, yeah. Um, but as we'll see, it's not clear that it can be. So just hold on to that thought and we'll see some of the problems that come up for it. But th that's exactly what they're hoping, that that will just be a definition. And it's, it's good that you put it in those terms, actually, because it is a, a semantic thesis and they are using the is of definition. So when they say Ushin is thirsty, uh, they're uh, saying that the way we should define what it is to be thirsty uh, so that's what the is is doing here, it's the is of definition, uh, is this definition. Did you have your hand? Yeah. But what if you happen to not be thirsty but then you bring your favorite beer, then you drink the beer, does that necessarily mean that you're drinking a lot of liquid because you're thirsty? What if you just happen to like beer? Right, so you're drinking something for reasons other than being thirsty. You like the taste, right? Yeah, I think that's going to be a genuine problem for the behaviorist, right? Um, it seems like you are now, I mean, even the simple definition there then is that, you know, you're actually drinking liquid now, and so you're exhibiting this behavior, and it seems like the behaviorist is committed to saying, you are, in virtue of that, thirsty. But you say, I'm not thirsty at all, actually. I'm just drinking it because I wanted to taste that flavor again. And that's going to be a problem. You're exactly right. So that's a problem for the behaviorist. We'll see, there are a number of problems f for the behaviorist, uh, including that one. Just to put that uh, problem in more general terms, is it the fact, is, is it the case that, um, in, because it's semantic theory, in order for it to function properly, each individual state must have a unique uh, behavior that pairs together? <laughs> yes, yeah, big problem. Uh, hold on to that thought just for a second, we're gonna see it uh, in just a moment. Okay, so just to put it in, in more uh, concrete terms here, the claim here on the dispositional account is not that, uh, say, S, of an agent, a person, uh, is in pain, is to be defined. That's what the equals DF means, by the way. Um, it, so we don't define S is in pain by S has pain behavior, but we say that S is being in pain uh, is defined as uh, S has acquired dispositions for uh, pain behavior. And this is analogous to other behavioral dispositions that objects have, like fragility. Uh, being fragile is uh, a disposition, say, that a glass, a wine glass has, uh, that it will break if put under a certain tensile uh, pressure or something like that, okay? Um, now notice that something can have, a wine glass is fragile even if it's not manifesting its fragility in breaking or smashing. Um, and a wine glass is still fragile even if it never manifests its behavioral disposition. But we can still say it's fragile, uh, that if it were to be put under those kinds of conditions, then it would break. And similarly, the behaviorist wants to say that uh, uh, mental state, uh, behavioral uh, descriptions of those mental states, so in terms of dispositions, uh, we don't have to be manifesting the disposition and we might never manifest it, but we might still have it. Okay, so let's see how this works. They wanted to just translate out all mentalistic language in this way. So let's have a little test case here, and we'll, all of these problems that uh, some of you have mentioned uh, will come up here. So let's take this sentence, Oshin is thirsty. Uh, so we said first that gets translated into uh, if Oshin on the, on the dispositional account, if Oshin had access to something to drink, he would drink it. Okay. Uh, now that took care, we thought, maybe of the um, desert case, but there's another problem here. Uh, I mean, look, you don't drink any old thing if you're thirsty. From there, um, engine oil is there, right? So it's not true that. Um, if Oshin had access to something to drink and that something was engine oil or uh, poisonous liquid or something, uh, that uh, he would drink it, okay? So we need to do a little bit more work. We need to say something like, 
If Oshin had access to something to drink and he believed it wasn't poisonous, let's say, then he would drink it. Now here's where the issue that you just mentioned comes up. Uh, you might think, well that's not enough even as it stands. You've got to add in like a long conjunction of things here now to specify, uh, narrow it down. Uh, so if Oshin had access to something to drink and he believed it was non-poisonous, and he believed that it didn't contain parasites, and he believed that there wasn't engine oil, and, 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 right? It seems like there's going to be no limit. Somebody's going to keep on giving you cases where you go, oh, okay, well, we can rule that one out with another and, okay? But it seems like it'll be an endless, possibly endless conjunction of specifications here. You're never going to be done, and so you're never actually going to have something that will, strictly speaking, uh, define the mental state. Yeah. Okay, and so uh, let's say, yeah, I mean, but the thing is, like, you could do it by saying, and he believed it was water, right? Uh, but the problem is um, that you might drink beer, you might drink a number of other things. So you've got to specify the class of things that you would find acceptable to drink, uh, exclude the class of things that you wouldn't find acceptable to drink. Uh, but look, that problem is there, and maybe there's some way of solving it. Uh, but just notice something else here. Uh, the specification that we've got here has a, a mental state attribution has crept back in. Because uh, we've got believed. So we say, uh, uh, and he believed it was non-poisonous or whatever. Okay? We've got to get rid of that now. Because they want to translate out all descriptions of mental states. So, well, they say, well, we can do that. Uh, so we'll translate, Oshin believes that X, anything, uh, we get translated into, if Oshin were asked if X were true, then he would say yes. Sounds reasonable on the face of it. Except, do you always tell everybody everything you believe? I mean, even if somebody asks you, um, sometimes we don't. So it might be the case for some things that in the ordinary way of putting things, we say we believe that when I ask you whether you believe it, you say no, right? Just because you don't want to admit to me like that you believe it or something like that. So we, that goes on all day, every day. Like we, people ask us things, uh, you know, would you like uh, another coffee? No, no, it's okay. Deep desire for another coffee, but you're being polite or something like that. So lots of reasons not to uh, manifest the disposition of saying yes when somebody asks you whether, you uh, whether, you, uh, um, whether X is true. Okay, so we need to do something to uh, uh, iron out that problem. So you might translate it into, if we if were asked if X is true and he wanted his interlocutor, the person he's talking to, uh, to know what he believed, then he would say yes. Okay, so now we don't have that problem. Uh, any other problems? Yeah, another mental expression has crept in here. And he wanted. Oh, okay, so we've got to iron that one out. But there's more in there. There's no and believed have gotten back in as well, okay? So here's the bottom line. People tried this for a long time. Uh, and it just turns out that it seems like it always happens when you try to give up completely dispositionally behavioral translation of mentalistic uh, descriptions or ascriptions that these terms always creep back in. Now, that has been taken by uh, many people and it's been taken by many people to just be a knockdown uh, argument against um, analytical or logical behaviorism. That's not actually totally conclusive because the mere failure of all attempts so far doesn't show that it's impossible. But as I put here, it really has been a long time since anybody has tried. You can go home and you can try it maybe uh, as a party game or something, very boring party, but anyway. Um, you know, let's try and translate out all these uh, be, uh, uh, mentalistic terms. It just seems like it's really, really hard to do uh, and nobody has ever been successful so far at it. Maybe you will be, in which case you'll become a famous uh, academic and rehabilitate the behaviorist movement perhaps. But only if you can also overcome these other problems. 
So this is the first problem that behaviorism has, that it just doesn't seem possible to do what it says it can do, translate out all these mentalistic terms. That's one problem. Let's see what the next one is. Here's another one, privacy. So consider the translation of love, so the feeling, the mental state of being in love or feeling love. Um, now let's say we've got some elaborate behavioral, dispositional behavioral description of, of that um, uh, term. Now however that elaborate that specification is going to be, it seems like it's possible to pretend to love or act as if you're in love for various reasons that I've put here. Um, I mean, actors presumably on the stage and in movies do this all the time, right? So you're on the stage, that's your job, you're an actor. And the logical behaviorist is going to be committed to saying, oh, they're manifesting the behavioral disposition in this way, satisfying the um, specification of what it is to be in love. They're in love. But the actor is just acting. They're not in love at all. And yet the logical behaviorist seems uh, committed to ascribing um, love to them. Um, now our ordinary concept of love obviously allows us to distinguish between true love and pretend love. And presumably when we enter into new romantic relationships, this is high on our list of things to determine, right? Uh, is this person really in love with me or are they just pretending? Um, but for the behaviorist, like, there's no difference at all. If they're pretending, then that's good enough. That's the real thing. But of course, that's not the real thing. So they've got no way of distinguishing between pretend love and uh, what we want to say maybe is the real feeling of being in love or, or feeling love. Okay, so that's a, another problem. There are more problems. Self-knowledge. So the behavior says, I have a headache. It's a pain. It's an internal, say, experience. That's a mentalistic expression. Uh, that's going to be translated as, I'm disposed to behave in a certain way. And so if you ask me whether I've got a headache, I have to look in the mirror and say, oh, I'm holding my head. Oh, I just really, I took some Panadol. Um, yeah, I guess I do have a headache. But that's not how we decide whether we have a headache. When somebody asks you, do you have a headache? You just sort of immediately, directly know whether you have a headache by, by experiencing pain, the pain of having uh, a headache. So that seems weird. It seems like nobody actually decides whether they have a headache in the way that the behaviorist says they do. So there's an old joke, there's a more racy version of it that uh, I won't mention here. Um, but what's funny about this? So the logical behaviorists are at a conference. They shake hands. You're fine. How am I? Right? Because the way to know about people's uh, uh, well-being or something here is just in terms of behavior. And so you might think that the behaviorist should think that you're better placed to know uh, somebody else's so-called mental states than your own. Um, and so the joke, you're fine, how am I? Fourth problem, phenomenal consciousness. Uh, for the logical behaviorist, to have pain is just to acquire behavior dispositions of some kind. Maybe to pull away from the painful <laughs> stimulus or something. Um, but behavior doesn't hurt, and certainly behavioral dispositions. I have the disposition to pull away when somebody st sticks a needle in me without warning. But having that behavioral disposition right now is not painful in any way. Um, and so the problem is, it seems like the pain disappears on the logical behaviorist's account. Just exhibiting behavior, because again, remember, somebody could act, perfectly act this behavior, uh, but they wouldn't, something would be missing, we'd say. Namely, the actual experience, the phenomenal experience, we'll talk about phenomenal consciousness later in the unit, um, of being in pain. So it seems like the painfulness of pain disappears out of the picture entirely on the uh, logical behaviorist's uh, picture. And there are also other problems, like the one that you mentioned earlier, where um, uh, we might manifest a behavioral disposition uh, but it doesn't pick out the mental state that the logical behaviorist is trying to translate, namely being thirsty, because you might manifest that behavioral disposition for an entirely different reason, um, which is another one that I could have added to the slides here, uh, but I didn't, but thankfully you mentioned. 
So there are all these problems. Um, and so logical behaviorism is really something that uh, nobody uh, holds anymore. So next week what we'll do is look at mind-brain identity theory. Now I just want to point out that the behaviorists were really onto something. They were right that we need to get away from introspective reports and try to focus on something more scientifically um, acceptable. Uh, but maybe they were wrong in looking at behavior. Uh, and the mind-brain identity theorist will offer us another alternative. Let's look at just the brain. And so behaviorism will say that to be in a mental state is to be disposed to behave in certain ways. Uh, but the identity theorist will say to be in a mental state is just to be in that neurophysiological state. Uh, behaviorism is, will, uh, will say a belief is the disposition to behave in a certain way. Uh, identity theorists will say a belief just is the firing of C fibers. There are no such thing as C fibers. They're just using that as a variable here. Uh, some kind of fibers in the brain. And the behaviorists are using the is of definition. It's a semantic theory. Uh, they're saying uh, belief, say, should be defined in this certain way. That's what the term belief means. That's what the term pain means. Uh, the identity theorist is using the is of composition. This bottle is plastic is to say, it's not a definition, right? Uh, it's saying what it's actually composed of. And the identity theorist will say something similar, that um, a belief is actually made up of brainy stuff, right? Uh, neurons and so on. Okay, so that's what we'll look at next week uh, when we get to the identity theory. Thanks. <laughs>